This is Brad Bailey. I'm in Los Angeles, California, uh, and I'm here with Robert Clement in Hollywood. And we're doing the oral Stonewall Oral History Project for the National Park Service. Great to meet you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. So can you give me your name, your birth date, and where you were born? Robert M. Clement, born March 12, 1925. I'm 93, and I was born... It's in a suburb of a small town, a place called Lee Park in Pennsylvania, and the nearest little town is Wilkesbury. And some people don't even know that. I have to mention Scranton. Perfect. So it was northeast Pennsylvania in a very tiny town. And so, um, what was life growing up uh, there? It for me was very interesting. Uh, in that, unlike so many people who are gay, I never had any problem when I lived in Pennsylvania, in you know, near Wilkesbury. It just uh, was odd. No one ever did anything like calling me a faggot or anything unusual. It was only my family that may have realized I was a bit different because when I was, oh, I suppose about 10 or so, <laughs> the only thing I'd ever heard was, oh, at one time I recall, I didn't realize it really was me, was someone saying, well, don't be a sissy. I didn't even know what a sissy was or by implication, but when I was as I say, about 10 or so, my grandfather, of all things, took me for a walk in the neighborhood. <laughs> and he started telling me things like, well, back then, I guess it was true, men never crossed their legs. Men don't do this or that. And I was so clueless I had no idea what this conversation was about. So I was sort of being told not to act gay. And I didn't even know the word. I didn't know anything about it. It was just, as I say, I was clueless and couldn't understand why my grandfather was telling me what was manly or not. What, what reasons did you, did you think he would bring those up to you at 10 years old, just out of the blue like that? Uh, well... Uh, because, uh, you know, in a, a very, very conservative uh, background uh, place, uh, you know, we didn't, hadn't gotten around to words like gay and so on. The only word I ever heard, with, you know, in that period was queer. And queer was, oh, that was a terrible uh, thing to be called. Queers were, you know, beyond the pale. So I knew that just, you know, in passing. And uh, I guess what he was trying to tell me was that some, the way I may have been uh, talking or something might have been interpreted as queer, but I had no idea what he was talking about. And what was the rest of your childhood like? It was very fine. Uh, normal standard. I had a, a brother two years older who died uh, last year and uh, a sister who's still alive in Wilkesbury and she survived and surviving still with uh, I guess it's I'm never quite sure <laughs> muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis. And you, you all live to your 90s. Pardon? You're 93 and your brother, who's was, two years older, just passed away. He was 94. And how old is your sister? She must be about 88 now or so. There was a six year difference. How long did your parents live till? Oddly enough, my father had been uh, gassed and in World War uh, One, So he died of Literally, well, it gets involved. Where he was born in Nanticoke, which is the same area. Uh, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Same area as, you know, Wilkesbury. Uh, 
his home the coal mining area and his home was next to what they called a breaker the coal would come out of the coal out of the mines come up this kind of long uh, line with you know buckets so to speak on it and it was crushed and their house was next door so it, when he died it was discovered that not only was it from the uh, gassing with mustard gas in World War One, but he had virtually anthracosis, which means uh, the lungs are filled with coal dust. So he died a combination of two things. So he didn't live that long, but he obviously lived to around 70 or so. I've forgotten his age precisely at the time he died. That's but great he myth. died from the effects in particular of being gassed and having this anthracosis, uh, you know, from the neighborhood where he lived. Wow, that's amazing that all three of you, <laughs> you know, lived to your late to the late eighties and nineties. That's that's um, at, at least the sibling, the the children. Yeah, you know, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So, what was the rest of your childhood like? It was very quiet. It was relatively uh, uneventful. But there came a period in my teens or so when I just knew I was different. And I was palling around with uh, a few other boys from the neighborhood, very local sort of thing. And the only reason I mention that is that my brother who married and had children, uh, and a very nice family back there, but uh, he, when I le left, when I was getting on towards 18 or so, I came back on one visit at that age. I never was really impelled to go back once I left, but I did, <laughs> and all of his friends were my friends that I'd known back when I was younger. Wow. So uh, I don't know if my brother was, was now called bisexual, but he had what everyone said. He had this marvelous friend. They went everywhere, did everything together, the hunting and the rest. And his wife had died, excepting for the one child, quite early on, and uh, he never had any other contact with, you know, he, there were no women in his life, it was, as far as I could tell, all men. And uh, so, anyway, I wonder about my brother to this day, because we never discussed sexuality between us in the sense of any reason to talk about it. You Even know. over a 90 year time period. Well, uh, oh no, uh, later on he knew, uh, but that was much later when I came out in New York City. Oh my God. And that was age 18 mm -hmm. onward. And so uh, I never saw much of him. Well, I stopped going home and uh, they I met my first and longtime lover and companion, which today would be called a husband, in London in 1959. But I was at that time, I still was doing, uh, call it straight things. I was, uh, I had been doing, uh, my life has been interesting that I've done a lot of different things. I've worked for uh, the United Nations, I worked for WNYC TV, the New York Station, and uh, so uh, uh, this coming out to my family uh, never really occurred until that point. And uh, what had happened when I left 
and said, well, I'm going back to live in, uh, you know, in New York and have this other life was that the family really knew I was gay, but I would moved out on my own and was by then living pretty much in New York. But I had just before I left for New York, I had, I guess you'd say, my first lover, my first intimate uh, sexual relationship. Uh, New York being what it was at that time, before settling down, it was a wild open place. And I mean, Christopher Street was, <laughs> it was the personification of gay sex, absolutely, at that time. What years were these? That had to be, well, uh, when I was about 20, and I was born in 20. So I was 45, uh, just, 1945. Yes, just after war service. So, all right, so you went to the war. You went to yeah. World War II. What was your service like in the war? Uh, it was very plain, nothing. I Did you go to, the, to Europe? Or? No, I was always stateside. Okay, good. And uh, I, well, as I say, I was in service. I was uh, about to go into the Air Corps, and I was discharged. And they, I've forgotten how they called it, but anyway, it was for mental problems. Okay, got and it. And obviously, I wasn't adjusting to being in service very well. And where, where, where did they base you? I'm sorry? Where did they, where, where, where they put you? Where did they put you? Oh, the funny thing was, yeah, they put me. In, I'm sorry to laugh because I was in Florida at the time. I'd been shipped to Florida, and uh, when they first discovered it, and I was billeted, oddly enough, on Miami Beach. It was all very, very nice, very jolly, and uh, I was heading a cadre. Well, they were using hotels, and I was heading a little cadre of men in you know, on one floor in the hotel. But one day I was out doing something and they noticed that I was twitching my got it, got it. shoulders and so on. And uh, they said, well, they, they said, well, okay, you better go to the hospital in no, Coral okay. Gables, okay. which is there and uh, they said, well, uh, they called things always neurotic and neurosis back then. And uh, so I was taken in when they discovered this, uh, doing this little thing, cadre business. And uh, uh, I was about to uh, enter into, uh, back then, what was Air Force. But suddenly they said, oh, and I was shipped off to a hospital. The reason I laugh is uh, I was put into a, a locked ward. Okay. And like, what am I doing here was my reaction. And, you know, oh, I don't know. I was in that locked ward only a very short time. And then they transferred me out to, you know, uh, well, it was odd being hotels. I was out of the locked ward into my own room and my own setup. Okay. So, so and you... then the doctors I saw and so on and so on. And then finally they discharged me. So let's talk about New York. Uh, you mentioned that in New York, by the time you got, you said in the, I guess before it, it was mm. like a hotbed of gay sex. <laughs> oh, Yes. Tell, tell me about that time in New York in the 40s. Oh, it was a great time to be a teenager and alive, you know, for sexuality in New York City. Uh, I, as I say, <laughs> I was going back and forth to my home uh, every weekend down to New York City. 
and uh, the West Side Y, to put it mildly, was very gay. Mm -hmm. And then there was another YMCA right in the heartland mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of t the Times Square area. So I would go to New York when I was at that age and to coming from where I did in Pennsylvania, it was eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And that's why every weekend I would end up going back to my home in Pennsylvania, looking forward to the then bus ride, mm -hmm. which took oh, well over four hours. Well, it, it was, it wasn't Greyhound, but it, mm -hmm. the old joke about the bus stopping at every street corner and so on. It was a slow bus ride back then. Mm -hmm. There were no super highways. <laughs> no, uh, no. And so I would go every weekend to New York City to the uh, find myself eventually uh, on uh, Christopher Street because it was fantastic for cruising. Mm. And I would stay at one or the other of the Ys. And uh, I was 18 and uh, so on. And uh, so it was the main gay attraction of the world. Very interestingly, uh, back then, and I understand since, all of the theaters mm -hmm. in that area uh, on the west side were cleaned up in the sense, but they were just uh, movie houses for junk movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you went into them, uh, most of them had balconies. Mm -hmm. And if you went up to the balcony of one of those theaters, mm -hmm. you were cruising mm -hmm. or cruised. So the, all those theaters, which back then were kind of decrepit, but they were gay, a great cruising ground, or you went out and onto Christopher Street, down to Christopher Street, and from uh, 6th Avenue over, but especially between 9th Avenue and the river, mm -hmm. it was, it was just, you know, it was a hotbed with emphasis perhaps on hot of being gay. Mm -hmm. It was the super center for gay things or being gay in New York City. That's where at one fa time there was the famous thing about the trucks. Mm -hmm. You went down there and there was, for some reason, there were a whole lot of trucks parked at night. Uh, uh, big ones, the kinds that you would take goods around mm -hmm. in, in the sense of crates and mm -hmm. things. And there are all these trucks open. <laughs> so the, the, the backs would be open, they wouldn't be closed. Mm -hmm. So there was the same thing of, I'm going to the trucks. And people would, you would go to the trucks, hop up on t into the interior of the trucks mm -hmm. because there was all of them down there mm -hmm. and they were just a place to have sex. Mm -hmm. It was quite fascinating going down to the trucks, which was the street parallel to Christopher Street down by the river. <laughs> the Hudson was a, a very nice river. <laughs> so what years were these, from the 40s through the 70s? I... Or 40s through, oh, so well, I guess the oh, cruising sort of environment. Oh. No, the trucks stopped. Uh, there was, a, must have been in a relatively early period uh, of going to Christopher Street. Uh, so that had to be uh, just after 1945, the trucks, but it was <laughs> notorious. Yeah. And uh, uh, finally, they they got around to keeping them closed, yeah, so yeah. that was the end of that. Yes. But it was no hardship because there was all of Christopher Street from there down to the river mm -hmm. to meet people. Mm -hmm. 
So if, you know, young <laughs> and sexually active, it was a great place. So what was the crowd like during that time? Was it black? Was it, oh, sorry, was it all white? Was it black? Was it all co um, professional, blue collar? What was the it crowd was like? It was probably uh, mostly white, uh, somewhat black, and the occasional Asian. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I guess it was, well, the city wasn't as mixed as it is mm -hmm. today. So I imagine, and I'd heard that there was, but I didn't know where, mm -hmm. a black cruising mm -hmm. ground up around 125th Street somewhere. Okay. So there wasn't that much interaction okay. socially, but there was a little. Okay. Uh, so I guess would white guys go uptown or black guys would come downtown? I right. Okay. And I think each one having a, a kind of mm -hmm. local area, mm -hmm. there was some movement back and forth, mm -hmm. but it wasn't integrated at all. Like hopefully mm -hmm. it is, I presume, or hope today because, uh, you know, I've been on the West Coast so long yeah. that things have changed mightily out here yeah. and for the better. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, as I say, but that's what it was like back then. But it was, to put it mildly, very active, very, very, uh, yeah. And eventually from the apartment I had at well, I was living with John. Uh, we'd met in 59 okay. and came back. Uh, I had a parish then. I was ordained priest and now a bishop okay. in the American Catholic Church. Okay. And so I had, when I met him, I had a, a parish in a little town called Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Yeah. And... Uh, he arrived and they just built me a, a brand new rectory. And most of the people in my parish were, back then they were still using the word Czechoslovak mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, now it's just Czech. Mm -hmm. But it was Czechoslovak and most of the people were, people who'd gravitated from the same towns into uh, the same areas. Mm -hmm in New York mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, but, but the parish I had then was uh, Czechoslovak but it was really Czech mm -hmm. uh, mostly it would be today like Prague you know uh, it, Prague is Czech yes, yes. it was mostly people from there but I had a large-ish parish yeah. in New Jersey okay. when I met John and they just built me a brand new rectory and I met John uh, in 59 and we were in correspondence and very close throughout that year and he came for a visit and of course I had the new rectory and he came to visit and I realized he was coming for four weeks at the time. And uh, visas and all were very easy back then. They weren't yeah. this complex business that's going on now. So he had a very open visa and could stay as long as he liked and so on. But he had planned on four weeks. Yeah. And he arrived and as I say, he came to my parish and I suddenly thought to myself, you know, I would like and hope he's going to stay after this. And he was perfectly willing to stay. But after four weeks, I realized there was no way I could have a lover in the rectory and be able to get away with it mm -hmm. or explain it. it, it you know. So uh, after he came, I, in four weeks, I had them contact the bishop and send a new priest. And then I had nothing because it was being a priest. 
it was a very tiny income. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we moved in to, into New York, into Christopher, this Christopher Street area, because a friend got us an apartment there. And uh, it was so expensive. It was $85 a month, but I had nothing. And I'd invited someone from England, and obviously there wasn't much money. I only mention it because for the first and only time in my life, I borrowed money from my family. And that $85 got me into the apartment in, uh, <laughs> in on Christopher Street. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, it, that was the, uh, well, the bank and forth, which shortly became moving on to Christopher Street. But as I say, it was, it was all very busy at that time. Christopher Street was, you could just, you know, it, it was, it would be more difficult than not. I mean, it was so, it was so easy. It would be more difficult to meet someone than to not meet someone on Christopher Street. It was wild. And uh, as I say, I was lucky eventually to have the double apartment on Christopher Street for all of $85 a month. What was the address on Christopher Street? Do you Pardon? remember the address or how far was it from Stonewall? Uh, I was, it, was only, I guess it was two blocks. Pretty close. It was quite close because I could walk down Fourth and there was Stonewall. But I remember Stonewall for a very different reason. I was living uh, and aware of things in New York City back when there was the breakup of, what was his name, Harry Hay? in Los uh, Angeles, uh, and it was all about communism. And back then, communism and everything was the Soviet Union. And it, you know, one didn't want to be associated with these things about the Soviet Union. So a man named Hal Call was connected out here with Harry Hay and company, but he was upset about the communist uh, connection. So he came to New York City and he brought the Mattachine Society to New York City. And their headquarters were the building that is still the Stonewall upstairs. And I had never connected the two together until much later because I wasn't really a bar person back then. Or if I went to the bars, it was to th the famous bird circuit, mm. which was the blue parrot, and uh, they were named for birds. I only remember the blue parrot, but there were four very active gay bars in the village, and of course, they were definitely mafia controlled back then, mm. because if they weren't, they couldn't have been gay bars, because they would have had no protection because quite honestly, uh, the mafia was very happy to make money off the uh, gay community, and uh, there were no women to any degree. Occasionally, a woman came into the bar. I only mention that because the word gay in those early days, the, it wasn't split into LGBT. Mm -hmm. Gay was everyone, included lesbians, anyone might consider themselves you know, bisexual or whatever. There was one term which really didn't turn into the uh, you know, LGBT or GLBT till later. So gay covered everything, but the bars were all run by the mafia and there were four or five of them. And uh, as I say, the blue part and uh, green something but anyway there there were a total of five of them or so all absolutely run by the mafia and 
later on when I started church work in New York City, which was, to put it mildly, a great success, there was one of the men I knew who was connected with them, and uh, he somehow, uh, I don't remember what it was, but the Roman Catholic Church would not perform a ceremony. So I married this man to his wife, and uh, they, uh, eventually, when I was doing a church work, this man who I'd married, this man and woman, came to me at one point and kind of suggested if I wanted some help, the mafia, well, he didn't call it mafia, obviously, mm -hmm. but I could get some help through him if I needed it for my church work. Fortunately, I did not need anything, and I thought to myself, it's, you know, thank you for the offer, but I'm not going to get my church work <laughs> involved sure. with the mafia. No, thank you. <laughs> and sorry, and where in New York City was your church again at that point? Oh, the 60s. Uh, yeah, at that time, we were a, a very large parish. Well, we were the only thing in town at that time because were you at, you were East I, Lord, I, I founded the first you? gay parish on the East Coast of Substance which was in New York City. Where at? And we used an Episcopal church uh, called Holy Apostles at 9th Avenue and 28th Street. Okay. And the interesting thing was... I think uh, there's, a health, there's a health department. There was a health department place there for a long time. Uh, well, that was there. later, yeah, later, apparently. But uh, we used their church and we used the parish hall and had a very nice office and all sorts of things were very good. And as I say, there was no other religious thing in the community. And uh, so we started there and religiously it was, you know, there was, there was no, as I think I may have said, no other game in town. We were the only religious concept in the gay community at that time. So we had this very large, very well-functioning parish, and it was we were using an Episcopal church, which itself, uh, even back then, some churches don't do very well but the, their diocese or synods or whatever will keep them open even with tiny congregations. So we were welcome. We had very good money. Mm. And uh, so we, we had a lot of use of that building. And our first service, we had maybe, oh, about, as there were people in the aisles but we had started our work a bit earlier, but the real opening to the LGBT community, we had our own vested choir. We were meeting at a small Episcopal church in the village called St. John's, mm -hmm. which I believe is still there, but it, it burned and was replaced with an, anyway, that's, I must stop getting off onto yeah, side fine. issues, yeah. but, uh, we were using this Episcopal church where, you know, as I say, we were welcome, but I remember when we were going to have our first service, we weren't sure uh, because there was a lot of religious animosity to the, what we called the then gay, but LGBT community. I mean, this was early days and they were still, we were still mainly from the rest of the world. We were just queers. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> having a, a gay parish was, was quite something. And we started having, anyway, we grew and blossomed and everything was 
fine for quite some time there. Uh, but the interesting thing is that there came a time after a number of years mm -hmm. where we had really overwhelmed the Episcopal congregation. But it wasn't so much that was a problem, but the Episcopal priest there, uh, after some few years had gone by, uh, we were a roaring success in all ways. And uh, we even had a religious order, at least a companion's uh, concept. We were doing marvelously well. MCC, which is the general Protestant church, as you know, for LGBT people. Uh, so MCC came along in about 73. We had started in 1970. But I want to ask a quick question, though. We'll get back to that. But I want to ask, what was life like leading right up to Stonewall? Because you, so you, you had your own church in Paris on 28th and 9th. And, and so what was life like? Uh, so when you first heard of the actual, what was life like the day pre preceding the event, if you can go back to there? Well, I was living in the village. Yeah. So uh, yeah, at first at uh, 4th and 10th, and mm -hmm. then later on Christopher Street. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was having a, you know, a very nice uh, life. And quite frankly, uh, even though John and I, by that time, been together, we had a nice open relationship. Mm -hmm. But we were, it's sometimes difficult for people to understand that you can be uh, a couple totally devoted to each other, but life wasn't just sex. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but we couldn't picture not being together, not living together. And he was a fabulous person to live with uh, without going into a lot of details. He was creative. He was the kind of British person that is so knowledgeable, but he could create things. Uh, You're this was made by John. The, that, on um, the wall there. He's, was point, he's pointing to a figurine, um, sort of a um, sort of called figure. A, they were called the maquettes. maquette. They derive from, uh, in the theater sometimes, when they were planning something, especially musicals, they would want to get an idea of what it looks like in advance, at, at least in England. And one created these It's almost costumes. like a figurine or doll, uh, sort of figurine, large figurine or doll with a very elaborate uh, sort of costume. In this case, um, yes. Sort of elaborate, very detailed costume that would be almost like a, you said, a predictor of a real life uh, outfit Absolutely. or Absolutely, and this is a maquette. A maquette. And he, I, over the years, for a very good reason, uh, created a number of them because there came a period when I left my parish and we were in New York City and this is a, the famous, I borrowed $85 from my family because I had so little from the parish, uh, which I, uh, I felt honor bound and I certainly did replace. But I began doing per diem work in television at ABC and other places and uh, uh, other studios and so on and that changed my life but that's what we lived on after we moved to New York City was the per diem work that I would get in television but he created many of these the reason I mention it for one thing though is that there were times when you know there wouldn't be that much per diem work at the studios ABC and uh, all of them, <laughs> and uh, he began creating these, and he had a market for them because they were so desirable that we're talking way, way, way back, uh, you know, a period in the 50s. The reason I mention it is that's what we lived on 
at times when I couldn't get work. Even back then, uh, guess how much they were paid? They brought in as a figure in a day and age when that was a lot of money. They would sell, uh, they were always they sold a thousand dollars a piece oh, wow. and there was a clientele for them and back then a thousand dollars was more like two thousand yeah, or more in value <laughs> that's a few months rent there so, so um, they they helped us get by so so did you go to Stowall a lot before the riot no no it wasn't a center for me uh, as I say uh, Usually, uh, at another point, I was just going to the bird circuit. Okay, so so what did you, so on that first night of the riot, the what was your only first time thing? I was in the village, village when the riots occurred was I had only been in the upstairs being the Mattachine Society, but the Stonewall, I'm sorry to say, was not a bar I went to. But you did go to the Mad Mattachine Society quite a lot. Oh God, yes. Um, and so, what was and so? How far again was the Mattachines from Stonewall? Oh, what? they were on the floor above. That you know that it's. So you did go through the bar, shape. past the bar, almost all the time. To oh get yes. To oh, yes. So, it just wasn't a bar. Where I drank, so, so um, but I certainly was aware of Stonewall. So all right, so did so on the nights of the riots. Uh, did, what were, what was your first hearing or inkling of them the first night? The the first night, uh, John and I were walking over Christopher Street at at Fourth and Christopher, uh, and we. John was with me, and we were just beyond the stone wall, uh, and we heard some kind of a noise going on. And John looked back, and he said, uh, and he walked back a little bit, and he said, uh, there's some kind of something going on with the police. And he said, <laughs> It looks like they're kicking at the police. That was the famous uh, high kicks, but we didn't know that. And John said, oh, wow. And we thought, well, there's, we didn't know what the confrontation was, had no idea it was Stonewall. And we kept going home saying to ourselves, well, we don't want to get back to this, whatever's going on, there's, you know, uh, we didn't know it was particularly gay. We just knew that there was the police and someone, and they were in opposition. And so we continued on our way. The, the interesting thing was, it was, you know, it's like they say, a rumor spreads like that. Well, that was the, the last night of the Stonewall riots. And as I say, we missed the actual riot because John looked back and said, well, some people having a problem with the police. And we didn't know it was Stonewall. So we, sorry, we continued on our way, but almost immediately within the next day, there was a feeling and it, it's very difficult to describe but there was a feeling that the world had changed. It literally, and I remember after that saying to John, because we had gone, been so near to Stonewall, but the spirit of Stonewall was like, it went from the bar to the whole gay community, which was everyone, but, uh, and I remember we were once again walking on Christopher Street uh, and saying, "You." I said to him, you know, with 
what, what's happened? Uh, things have changed and I feel free. And I feel so free, I'm never going back to what was. And that was Stonewall. Stonewall created almost immediately a concept of worth in people, of all the things that we've done, good or bad, we were a recognized group of people and the feeling was, you know, it's hard to explain, but it was, it was everyone, the friends we knew, everyone saying, I'm free. Somehow it became a universal message. We were free, and when you're free, finally, you're gay, you're yourself, and you've accepted yourself, but you're telling the world, you've got to accept me. This is me, here I am, here are the gay people. And back then, as I say, Ghent was everything LGBT. But it was a freeing pro, I, I can't quite describe how marvelous it felt two days after Stonewall because there was kind of feeling amongst everyone's friends, amongst everything, that a new era, a new day had come and one wasn't ever going to hide, you know, in general and in from for society that they were gay. You know, that was it. Uh, it was a marvelous experience, and as I say, I'm repeating myself, but I remember saying to John, you know, I feel free. I feel very free, and I'm never going back to the way things were, which meant I was accepting myself and accepting the then general term gay community was for everyone. We were real people in our own right. And it was never going to hide, never going to take a second class position ever again. In one space is what had happened. And by God, it was true. It just, it seemed to me it was from that moment on that just about everyone and everything that was gay just said, this is it. We are us. We are our own people. And I called it liberation. I don't know what others called it. But we were a community. We hadn't coalesced yet, but, you know, excepting for bars and a few things. But this was an embracing thing. You felt part of a community of people. And it, it, and it, it was, and it, it changed Christopher Street. You know, it wasn't just a cruising grounds. You felt if you, like, went out of your apartment, you didn't have to be going out to cruising, the cruisiest part of the village. You just knew that you were stepping out now amongst people who had rights and a place in the world. And that's the best I can say about it. It was the turning point for life. Wow. And so, um, and so today, um, how do you, you, I guess you spoke on that, uh, I guess a little bit. What do you, what do you think the legacy of Stonewall is today? Now, so many years later, almost 50 years later, what do you think that legacy is today in the gay world? Or in the world in general? Well, I understand there was something out here called the black cat and so on, and that was very important to people in Los Angeles. But on the East Coast, being Stonewall and us turning into a kind of riotous people demanding our rights, and within a year, it was incredible what happened at the one year anniversary of Stonewall. So uh, everything was changing. You felt everything should be all right about being gay, lesbian, you know, 
and we were, as you might say, morphing really into a community because one year later, 1970, on the anniversary of Stonewall, I was living, as I say, uh, actually I was up in, not in the Christopher Street apartment, but the one at Bank and 10th. And John and I walked down, this was a year after Stonewall, and it was when I had decided I was going to make a statement. And I put on my priest cassock, and I had that sign that John made saying, gay people, this is your church, with the, the dove, which is the Holy Ghost, descending. So I went as a priest with that sign, and John went with a one-page handout that we gave to everyone we could in sight at Christopher Street, the one first year anniversary, and it said that we were going to have our service at this church on 28th Street uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, starting two weeks later. We handed, you know, and normally, you know, when people give you things, you find them scattered around. We never found any of our one-page descriptions of why we felt the church should be for everyone. Mm -hmm. This was before there were any accepting churches. We had to have our own. And as I say, we gave out these papers uh, saying that, I think it was the 16th or 18th, in roughly two to three weeks after the first stone wall. But we handed out all these papers and me carrying the sign and parading, as you know. We technically, we didn't go up Fifth Avenue. Everyone thinks we did. We went up Sixth. But by next year, the city couldn't stop us. <laughs> Fifth Avenue was ours. But we went up to Central Park to what was called the Sheep Meadow. And what had happened, though, was on that first anniversary, when I say I, we went down to, from the place at uh, 10th, which was quite close to Stonewall. We weren't in, uh, you know, weren't staying there at the moment, but we knew something was going to happen on the first anniversary. And that's why I was going to make it clear that there was a religious point of acceptance in a society that in religion was very anti-gay, you know, it was just dreadful. Uh, so we got down to Christopher Street and we couldn't believe what we saw because from the corner of 4th and I think it's 7th or 6th, there was a sea of people just I don't know how many thousand people showed up for the anniversary of Stonewall, which began, of course, at Christopher Street. And uh, it was weird because people knew the parade route. And there were thousands parading up uh, from Christopher Street to Central Park. And the people who knew about it and knew the route <laughs> we were going by, and it's full, the crowd of people. We were thousands, and I don't know how many more were people who'd come to see who were obviously gay, lesbian, and so on, joining this parade. And by the time we got up to the uh, sheep meadow, I don't know man, how many thousands we were, but uh, I've always thought it was maybe as much as uh, 50,000, but it, you know, it could have been only 20 or 30, but it was an incredible amount of people. And as I say, from this big crowd on Christopher Street, so many others joined. And 
the problem with getting up there was no one had thought at that time to set up a public address system. So to uh, talk to anyone, one or two people had bullhorns and so on, but beyond that, you could only address a small group of people with this mass of LGBT people, because I guess none of us quite realized how, how we would come together. As I say, I was going out to make a statement about the church and got to Christopher Street and was in awe of this vast number of people and all the great numbers who joined on the way. And it wasn't very well organized. Uh, the newspapers, the Post was, uh, when we were functioning as a gay church, we got more coverage from the Post than from the New York Times, but even they had to cover this march. But uh, there were only three things at that march that the press could cover. One was this idea that no one had, that there would be so many gay people willing to be out and proud now that all these queers suddenly, they, they were telling the world, we were telling the world, here we are. And so uh, the thing that the uh, media uh, concentrated on was three things. The fact that there were thousands and we ourselves didn't realize we were such a big force. And the second thing was there were some drag queens in full drag carrying on. So they, they were interested in the crowd, in the drag queens, and myself, this clergyman with the banner. In fact, I don't know where, but on, I'm still on the internet to this day, you can find I guess, I don't know if it's just with my name because there's information about me on the internet, uh, but that picture is still seen and was reproduced recently for some work I was doing, you know, out here in Los Angeles. So I could find that by just sort of Googling Robert Clement or how could I? I would hope so, or... So what's the picture? Is the picture of you? with this sign, with John standing next to and me. The sign says, and it comes in two slight variations because there's, I remember John is not quite in the same place <laughs> on the second one, what's but it's there. What's the sign and uh, the, precisely the reason they took it is to get that sign in. Okay. And what's the sign say though? Oh, gay people, this is your church. And in the middle of that is a dove, which I consider the Holy Spirit, descending, uh, you know, on all this great crowd of uh, LGBT people. Okay, wow, perfect. And so you continued your um, your ministry. What did you you, you for your so your whole life? You've been an ordained minister. Oh, I, I was ordained way back in. Uh, I'm not sure it was. 48, 48. Wow. So you, you're uh, way up in Woodstock. So I've been a priest since 1948. Wow. I've been doing other work, but, you know, uh, amongst gay people uh, as a coverage word before that. But I was ordained in a little church uh, in the real woods town of Woodstock, New York, mm. because the Woodstock festival mm. actually didn't take place there. It was a little farther away, but I was ordained in Woodstock, New York, and apparently the church is still there, a little wooden country style church. Wow. And that was, as they say, 1948, and uh, I've been a priest ever since. And uh, that's why I, you know, being from my background and having 
associated with other independent priests. There were a number of them around uh, who were gay uh, was fine. But back then, we, were, we wouldn't be as welcome today as, you know, uh, and we weren't welcome back then. Mm. Today, uh, if you're going to be a, a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, you have to follow uh, Mr. Clinton's thing, mm. uh, don't ask, don't tell. Yeah. But I mean to be out, and I've always been out, uh, but uh, that was because I came out at the anniversary of Stonewall, and uh, I wasn't hiding anymore, and uh, How did people I, I, as I say, I, I started the church work, the first on the East Coast. Well, there was something started in 46, mm -hmm. but that gets uh, in Atlanta, but something very strong and pronounced because the people who did the work in Atlanta gave us even their name if we want to use it so we can have two names today. But we're a continuation. What, what do you mean in Atlanta? There was pro in Atlanta, there was a young man newly ordained in the Roman Catholic Church, and almost immediately when he was ordained, he looked around and he said the church is anti-gay and he proceeded to say, well, I'm not and I'm not going to work in the church. And he was trying to organize and organized a small work in the Atlanta area in 1946. Okay, what was his name, do you know? Oh yes, Archbishop uh, Hyde. Hyde, okay. H-Y-D-E. And so what George what, Hyde. And so he ordered, what did he do in Atlanta? He went to a bar, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, which was a well-known, apparently, gay bar. You know, back then everything was Sub Rosa, mm -hmm. but in Atlanta, and he was able to get a room in the same hotel next to the bar a kind of small ballroom, and apparently he started having celebrating mass there. And I have his original vestments. Oh, do you? Yes. How did you get them? From him, because he was a very good friend, and his work had, well, it had kind of petered out in the Atlanta area, though later on I met people from Atlanta who knew him, but for some reason, I, I don't know if it was family or what, he had to move back to his family home in Anderson, uh, I think that's South Carolina. Okay, and that's where he was living. And when he heard about the work I was doing, he said, oh, fine, I consider you a continuation of what I was doing in the Atlanta area, mm -hmm. and you can call yourselves Eucharistic Catholic, which was their name, mm -hmm. and Church of the Beloved Disciple, mm -hmm. and we were American Catholics, so technically we're also the Eucharist, we are the Eucharistic Catholic continuation, but our big work was as the American Catholic Church, which wasn't, wasn't founded as a gay work, it was founded in 1915, mm -hmm. and we received the charter for it because of what Bishop Hyde had done. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's our work also called the American Catholic Church. And we thought that would be more understandable. So when he said, you know, here's the incorporation for the American Catholic Church, we said, that sounds good. We're the Amer we'll be the American Catholic Church, and we have that incorporation from 1915 to this day. We are charters in the state of Illinois. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. It um, may be too much. No, I'm no, sorry. it's been fantastic. There's so much I would love to cover. Uh, we, you know, I definitely want to, you know, schedule another interview for another time, possibly, because you have such a breadth of information i think that's just so valuable in so many ways with 
with just your long life and your long experience with with gay issues that spans almost a century, really. And it, you know, it's, yeah. it's something that really is fascinating. I think needs to be um, followed up on, you know. Right. So, uh, you know, and I think needs to be sort of, and cause that, you know, especially if you haven't done sort of, have you done other I interviews and stuff before? Oh, yes. Okay, excellent. But in fact, they're going to have a, uh, a panel discussion here uh, on the 30th. Okay. And this time round, uh, the people said, we want you on the panel because your, your, uh, what should I say? You, I project interest and, in, you know, and mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. And so they said, we want you on the panel here this year. <laughs> so, uh, the word got around because I've been living here slightly less than a year, but uh, people in the building knew that I was this person who can and would speak out in very positive ways. So this year I'm on the panel here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Clement. It's been such a pleasure talking to you here in Los Angeles today. Uh, and thank you again. You're very welcome, and thank you. Thank you very much, and I hope whatever I'm saying will be helpful to you. Absolutely, and certainly will. Okay. Thank you. Bless you.